Welcome to Agile Talk Show. Grab a coffee, take a seat. For the next half an hour, we will hear a tale about mentorship, synthetic biology, and a bunch of other crazy stuff. Our guest tonight is Nanan Jung, Education and Outreach Officer at After IGEM, and we will talk about frogs, cornfields, and advices. Not exactly in that order. Check it out! So that's one of the powers of IGEM, right? The, the I and IGEM stand. It's international, right? So you gotta be able to look at, you know, how people do research in different places, in different cultures, different backgrounds. This is all very powerful, right? You know, think about the power of advice. So these are lessons learned that took a lot of time for someone else to learn that they can teach you in a much shorter amount of time. But then that got me thinking about not only the sustainability of the environment, but what about the sustainability of science itself? Welcome, Nanan. Welcome to Agent Talk Show. It's a pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to, to talk with you again. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. You were part of Agent TV last year, so some people in our audience already saw you on, on our screen telling some very interesting stories. Uh, thank you for joining. All right, Guillermo. Yeah, th thank you for having me back on uh, the iGEM TV uh, talk show. <laughs> Excited to be here. Welcome, welcome. So the, the idea here is to navigate through your memories, talk a little bit about your life, who you are, what you did. Um, and the idea is to talk a little bit about advices, mentorships, people that we find in our lives, share some some ideas, inspire some people. So let's see, let, let's take a deep breath and uh, go into your, in, in your memories. And to, to start, I'd like to ask you about little Nanan. If, I think if you were Brazilian, we would call you Nananzinho or Nanu. Okay, I, I'll, I'll, I'll I don't know. That. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I, I'd like to know about your childhood. Where, where were you born? How was your childhood? I do know that you moved in, um, very, in a very early stage of your life. So how was little Nanan? Oh, you, you, you did, uh, you, you uh, dug up a lot of research there, Guillermo. <laughs> so, so yeah, you're right. So I did move uh, pretty early. So, um, I'm actually, um, uh, I'm, I'm actually Chinese by birth. I was born in China. Um, and then I uh, came to the U.S. Uh, when I was five years old, actually. Um, so I came to the U.S. Pr pretty early. Um, did not speak a word of English, uh, spoke, well, well, my parents told me that I spoke decent Mandarin, but I don't know that, so I'll, I'll take their word for it. Um, so I came here early on uh, when I was five, and then, uh, let's see, went to Colorado at first. And then uh, when I was in elementary school, I moved over to Ohio um, and then finished up uh, high school there. Um, and that's kind of when I got uh, got interested in biology. So I had a really good biology teacher in high school. Um, our high school is really small, but I but I had a really good biology teacher, um, Ch Charles Simmons, Ch Chuck Simmons. So I still remember him. So we had uh, we had these lab practicals. So you know, a traditional test, you sit there and you take an exam, right? These tests were you go around, you would do dissections, you would identify different parts of like a frog, a worm, you know, and that was just a really nice hands-on way of learning, right? I I'm not saying I was good at lab practicals. These are a form of these are a form of tests, examinations, right? I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was very good at them, but, uh, but it was just really interesting, right? It was a very nice hands-on way of learning. So I kind of got interested in, uh, in biology in, in that respect at the, at the high school level. Oh, that's very interesting. I, I do remember my, my high school teacher that uh, took me to the lab and, and uh, we did some of like the, the section of a frog. We, I, I think I had a similar experience and I got excited about biology around this time so this may be i i need to thank my my high school uh biology teachers for this and it, it's interesting that we share a very similar experience in opposite sides of the hemisphere like opposite sides of the the americas <laughs> and the next step was studying biology so um how, how was your undergrad experience yeah so you know my next step was uh, studying biology so uh, so as we just talked about you know i got interested in biology right but you know Nobody really asked me how you want to turn this into a career. How do you want to turn this into a job, right? It's, you know, do whatever you want to do. Find something you're interested in. Follow your passion type of thing, right? So I knew I wanted to study biology. I was really interested in biology, right? So I um, the next step would be college. So I took my... Uh, 
I I went to a college at Purdue. Um, I don't know if uh, your viewers uh, know where Purdue is. Uh, the main campus is in uh, West Lafayette, Indiana. Um, it's in the Midwest in the U.S. So if you if you just Google images of the Midwest, uh, you look uh, to your left and to your right, you see uh, just rows of cornfields. Okay, so it's it's it, it's it's known for agronomy. Okay, so um, so so you see these huge cornfields. That's what you see outside of campus. You drive outside of campus, you see cornfields. So. I was, let's see, this was, I think, my sophomore year of college. So I was at Purdue majoring in biology. Again, really liked biology, didn't really know what to do with it after after school, though, right? So the summer of my, I believe it was my sophomore year, you know, I wanted to earn some extra income. I was staying on campus over the summer. So what do you do as a college student who is at a institute like Purdue over the summer. Well, you work in the cornfields. So that's what I did. I, I, I so I worked, worked in the cornfields. I was shoot bagging and picking corn and stuff and transplanting corn seeds and then germinating corn, corn seeds in the, in the greenhouse and then transplanting them in the cornfields. And so it was, uh, it, it was fun times, right? So, um, that was actually in a different department. It was in the department of agronomy, but, uh, but so, you know, it, it it was it was hard work though because it was over the summer and it was hot and it it, it was physical labor and so I worked with the uh, I, I talked with the professor that I was working with there uh, Cliff Weil so I I went out with him one day uh, it was over a weekend I think to to water plants because we had to water them every day um, and we would take turns we would take different shifts for who has to work on the weekend and so you know, on the way back you know I asked him so hey what got you what got you interested in planting corn for the rest of your life. So he wanted to be able to resolve this concern and be able to feed the ever-growing human population. And so that's why he went into agronomy to find, uh, to find perhaps different mutants of, uh, of, of corn that might grow, uh, that might grow differently, that might grow to a different uh, calorie uh, density, that might grow uh, to a different height, for example, right? So this is really interesting stuff. And so this is kind of what got me, uh, what got me interested? It, well, well, it kind of solidified my interest in in biology. I was still interested in biology, but dear me, I think this is that this is probably my first. Uh, this is probably my first contact with this with this concept that we call an IGEM uh, human practices, right? So not just doing biology because or majoring in something because I'm interested in it personally, but you have stakeholders, you have people depending on you, you have a purpose that's not that's outside of yourself, right? You have an external motivation for doing the for doing this work, right? Uh, so from there, I, uh, I was still in college. Uh, my junior year, uh, at Purdue, I, uh, applied for a internship through the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So this is more on the medical side, but I got an HHMI internship, uh, and that was, uh, to fund me to be able to work, uh, in a microbiology lab at Purdue over the summer. And this is with, uh, with a really cool guy named, uh, Lou Sherman. Um, he was to this day probably one of the best mentors I've, I've, I've ever had. Um, he was always happy. I don't know how he did it, but he was like, you go in, you say the experiment works. He was happy. You go in and tell him the experiment didn't work. Still happy. You, you, you were talking about the, the, your experience with, um, corn and seeing people that, um, leave from the land and seeing how science can be a very practical thing, something that impacts people's life. And this is a very powerful concept and a very interesting concept to see this in front of you like this is biology solving people's life uh, people's problem like it's feeding people and uh, I, it, this is this is very relatable to me because i come from a family of farmers like uh, uh, oh, my, really? my grandma is still, nice. yes yes like uh, actually my my, my grandma is still has is still like my, my parents are teachers, but my grandma still works with um, agriculture, and they are harvesting uh, corn this week. <laughs> so oh, really? This was <laughs> extremely relatable to me. So that's a very. I just like. Uh, sorry for interrupting, but uh, I just like. No, 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 no that's good. It's good. Yeah. That's very. All right, cool. Yeah, I didn't know that. Very, very... Yeah, I, I think most people don't know because it's very far from what I do nowadays. And it's very, very powerful that when we are doing um, when we are doing science, when we are doing technology, when we are doing biotech, like we are creating things that can change, can directly impact uh, the life of thousands, of millions of people. And it's very powerful when we see some of those faces, like when, when we see those people. And I think uh, through human practices, IGEM does that a lot. 
of course, when, when we are talking about agriculture, I, I see my grandma's face. So it's, it's very, very relatable to me. But uh, th this is a very powerful concept because you, you don't get isolated on this ivory tower doing science without thinking about the world outside. So uh, I, I think uh, what you were just talking about is a very, very interesting advice. Like there, there's a reason. I mean, it's not always, it's not all science that need, needs to have this uh, very clear application. We all know that. But when you are working with applied science, it's very, very powerful and very important to think about the people that will use that science, right? This can help a lot in improving what you're doing. So we, we are going towards the end of your undergrad studies and then, uh, and then you follow the academic pathway. So, so towards the end of my undergrad, okay. So towards the end of my undergrad, and I, I, I maybe didn't do such a great job of figuring out what to do career-wise because I, 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 I knew the same thing as I was going into college. You know, I was still interested in biology. Now I kind of narrowed down my focus a little bit. I was interested in microbiology. Now I was working with bacteria, so I was interested in microbiology and that experience going back to the science of bacteria. You know, it, it. It opened my eyes to the power of microbiology. You have these microscopic organisms that you can't see, um, but they can affect the world economy, right? So, so, so it exposed me to, to the to the power of of microbiology. So now I really want to study microbiology, right? But I still don't know what to do career wise. And so, if you're in the department of microbiology, you you graduate with your class, and then in my case, you know, about half my class went to med school, half my class went to grad school. Um, I didn't really know which one to do. I I, I picked grad school, so, so so I went to grad school. Um, so I went to do my master's uh, at the University of Illinois uh, at Urbana-Champaign, uh, also in the Midwest, also famous for cornfields, by the way. Um, yes, there's a pattern here. I don't know why, but yes, there's a pattern. So I got my PhD uh, while working at a national lab uh, through the University of Tennessee. Um, I will say this: this is a this this is also a very interesting experience uh, for me here. So. This joint program, this is not a typical program. This is an interdisciplinary program. Uh, not only is it interdisciplinary, this is a program, this is a PhD program that was founded in part by a former governor, a former state governor of the state of Tennessee. And so, you know, I, I knew this going in and at, at the beginning, you know, I was like, I, I don't really want to have anything to do with politics. I just want to go do my science, you know, like I didn't really understand the importance there, right? I, I didn't see the connection. But then this former sitting governor, his, so the PhD program is called the, the Bredesen Center. So uh, uh, Phil Bredesen is is the governor we're talking about here. So Harvard graduate, really smart guy. Uh, and he would actually come talk to us about once a year. And he would tell us his philosophy behind science and why science is important. Uh, but also what he sees our role as scientists being. And you know, having done a master's before, I'll tell you, I, I remember a time when I was, uh, when I was walking home from lab, I was living close enough to lab that I could walk home. I was walking home from lab during a sunrise, not during a sunset, during a sunrise. Like I was in lab the whole night and I was walking back home as the sun was rising the next day. And at the time I was like, I'm such a good scientist. I'm spending so many hours in the lab, you know, I'm killing it. Right. So, but it was talking with this, with this governor that taught me, you know, science, so much of our science is funded by taxpayers, but too often they're left in the dark about what we actually do with their money. They pay us to do work, but we don't really tell them very much about what we do with their money. Right. And so in the beginning, my concept of being as good scientist was just live in the lab. Right. But now I see, you you know, oh, you have so much more responsibility as a scientist. You have to do science communication. You have to out, do outreach. You have to you, you're accountable to your stakeholders. Right. As scientists, we are public servants. We're not doing science for ourselves. We're serving someone else. I, I like to think about our life or our memories as a river. And in this river, you have several harbors that are places that we could have gone somewhere else. Like you could have stopped it in one of those harbors and took took an, an airplane or took a car or took another boat and going in, in another direction. And it, it's very interesting because the, you can tell someone's story without telling like what you did every single year of your life, all the, the projects you did, because you are, you are skipping a lot of stuff. Like you, you, I do know that you did a bunch of very interesting stuff. But you can tell someone's story just 
with those harbors. So uh, until this point in your life, we can tell this story with uh, the high school teacher showing you a frog, the the professor talking about corn, and now th this this conver uh, this conversation with the governor talking about your program and what uh, a scientist like the social impact of a scientist. So it, it's very interesting because you can you can see those key points, and by connecting them. You, you can revisit your life. So th this is very, very cool. Yeah, th there's another harbor that I would like to, to talk about and an experience. I, I went through this experience and I do know how powerful it is. And I'm sure a lot of other people went through the same thing. Uh, you you went, you you spent some time abroad, right? How yes, that's experience? right. I, I, did, I, I did spend some time abroad. So uh, so let's say I... Uh, I uh, I docked my boat in a in a harbor uh, that is in the state of Tennessee. That is, that that is actually a landlocked state, so maybe that's not a great example. But let's say I docked <laughs> my boat. There. We do have the Tennessee River, so let's say I docked my boat there. And so, what you're referring to, Guillermo, is uh, is uh, I did an internship uh, in the northeastern part of China. In what is this? This is in 2016. Uh, in 2016, and so I went to China to do some groundwater sampling. And then we set up some microcosms there. So we would sample groundwater, uh, and then we would, and then we would add certain, uh, certain types of, uh, chemicals. And then we would monitor that, that chemical over time to see if it would degrade. And if it degraded, then we could speculate and say, Oh, so maybe there's something in here that's actually being able to be degrade this chemical. So then we can try to characterize uh, that bacterium or, or or those bacteria together. Forget what uh, I forget what Brazilian name you gave me, but, uh, but but yeah, when I was at that age, you know, I came over to the U.S. I um, well couldn't speak English, right, and could, could only speak Chinese. And then I, I got this internship in China, and you know, at the beginning, I was like, "This is the country I'm from," you know, "This is my country." I I go there, and they're like, "No problem, I got this," right? So I, I take my flight, go over to China, you know, and then I get off the plane and. I couldn't order lunch. So I was like, oh, geez, I can't even, you know, so how am I going to do this? Right. So it, it, it's kind of amazing, right? You, if you spend most of your life in one country, right, you it's very easy to go on autopilot. You wake up in the morning, you know everything, you know how to do everything, you know how to say everything. You don't have to think about these things. Right. But, you know, you take a simple plane flight over to another country and then you land and then you find out like, oh, I, maybe I don't know so much, right? So, so that's one of the powers of iGEM, right? The, the I and iGEM stand, it's international, right? So you gotta be able to look at, you know, how people do research in different places, with different cultures, different backgrounds. This is all very powerful, right? So- Yeah, that's very interesting. And um, so you, you mentioned iGEM, how, how did you, when was the first time you heard about iGEM and how did you get involved with iGEM in the first place? So I got involved in iGEM in 2018. So my uh, my PhD advisor um, agreed to be the faculty advisor for the University of Tennessee iGEM team. Um, and then he promptly nominated me to help uh, mentor the team. And so I was like, okay. Uh, I didn't know anything about iGEM. I, I didn't know what iGEM stood for. I, I was still trying to figure out what iGEM stood for. I, I was still trying to figure out why the I wasn't capitalized. I was like, why don't they capitalize the I? Like, it doesn't make sense. So, you know, I was still trying to figure this out, right? So I didn't know anything about iGEM. Um, and, and so, and so you're right. My first experience with iGEM was actually as a graduate instructor. Um, I, I was actually never an iGEM student. You know, I see iGEM as an experiential learning opportunity that puts the students first. It's, it is a competition at heart, but because I joined iGEM as a mentor, from me, from my perspective, it was always about the education. Um, it wasn't so much about winning that gold medal. It was more about the education opportunity there. And I'd like to, to ask you more about what happens after iGEM, because I do know that you got involved in several different projects in uh, after iGen and I'd like to to hear more about what you are doing nowadays in in, in iGen I know that you are involved in a super cool program the type of uh, graduate program that I was in and because I was exposed to iGen uh, I understood the the power and importance of science communication right so I then contacted uh Hussain, actually so I contacted Hussain, uh who was then uh, the chair of the communications committee um and said hey you know I'm interested in in uh, maintaining contact with uh, with iGEM, uh, I graduated, so I don't have an iGEM team 
directly anymore. Uh, but I would like to be involved. I would like to stay involved in iGEM. And so the first project that I was involved with was the iGEM Digest, which everyone should go read. Uh, this is, uh, our official iGEM magazine. Uh, and I was, uh, a guest editor for issue four. Uh, that was when, uh, Hasnain and, uh, Amy and, uh, Amy Chen, uh, uh, were, uh, were the co, co editors in chief. And so they graciously allowed me to be a guest editor, uh, for the iGEM Digest, got involved with that. Uh, from there, I entered the, uh, the communications committee for, for after iGEM, uh, which is the committee that kind of oversees, uh, the iGEM Digest as well as the after iGEM newsletter, uh, as well as other science communication aspects. In addition to that, I'm, I have now joined the, uh, the education network as well. So I'm now a member of the, the steering group for the, uh, after iGEM education network as well, uh, where we house the, uh, mentorship program. Uh, the mentorship program is something that uh, the team started back in 2015. And this is an opportunity where they take experienced iGEMers and pair them with teams and with iGEM teams. And oftentimes these can be newer teams. I any iGEM team can apply for this, but uh, oftentimes you have newer teams or maybe teams that have maybe experienced a gap here, you know? So either you're a new iGEM team and you're still trying to figure things out or you're an experienced iGEM team, but you know, maybe you didn't go to the Jamboree for the past couple of years and now you have a, a fresh team, you have a new faculty advisor, you have new students. Um, so it's essentially almost a new team, right? So you might want someone who's more experienced in the iGEM process who may be able to guide you along the way, right? So, so, th so this network has been very successful in pairing these experienced mentors, uh, with the, uh, with teams. And so I was actually one of these mentors, uh, last year. So I was paired with the NJU China, the Nanjing University uh, iGEM team in China uh, last year in 2020. And I continue to advise them uh, today, actually. I actually have a call with them tomorrow morning. <laughs> so so, we, so I really enjoyed this this process. And I think mentoring is uh, is very important. As as we mentioned before, you know, I've gotten a lot of advice from, uh, from previous mentors in my life, right? So out of the mentorship program from last year, uh, something that grew out of that was actually the the uh, Mentors Network, which is one of the main initiatives that we have for this year in After iGEM. So the Mentors Network kind of harnesses the power of our After iGEM community that we've been talking about, right? So the mentorship program will pair an experienced iGEM mentor with a team, and that mentor follows the team throughout the competition, right? But as we talked about, we have after iGEM. So iGEM doesn't end, right? So what happens if, uh, so what happens after, the, after the competition? Well, you have the mentors network, which is an inter international and interdisciplinary group of, of experts in different areas, not just synthetic biology, but they can be experts in science communication, science policy, human practices, fundraising, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so let's say during your team, let's say during your competition, you want some help with modeling. Or you need some help uh, fundraising, or you need some help recruiting for for your team, right? So you can contact the mentors network, and we can pair you with someone with experience in that area. Uh, very very interesting project. I, I also worked on the mentorship program. I, I was one of the coordinators in 2018, so it's very very nice to see it growing and becoming something bigger and better. That that's that's awesome. Uh, I have I have another question for you, but this is a little bit more philosophical. If if the current Nanan met the, the little Nanan or the Nananzinho from a few years ago, um, first, how do you think this conversation would go? And second, what would be the advice that you would give to yourself, to the younger version of yourself, thinking about all those experiences that you shared with us? Well, um a lot of the advice that I give my students now, right? So, so, so first I would have uh, joined Purdue's iGEM team because I didn't know about it at the time. So, so, or, or, well, better yet, I would have uh, joined iGEM as, as a high school student, right? So that, 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 that of course, that, that, that's, that's a given, right? Um, but, uh, what I tell my students now, right? So as far as, uh, as far as looking into your career exploration, um, informational interviews, job shadowing, and then internships. Right. And then I tell them to do this in this order because an informational interview, it might take 30 minutes, right? 20, 30 minutes. It's easy to set up. So it's not that much of a time commitment. 
And then if you're still interested, then you do a job shadowing. Hey, can I, uh, can I shadow you for a day or a couple, or a couple of days or maybe a week, right? Um, and then if you still like it after that, then you do internships. Internships may be over the summer. It might be three months, right? And I recommend students do it, do it in this order because, because of time commitment. If you do your informational interview and then you say, Oh, this isn't for me. Then you already know that. So then you can do your, your next informational interview with someone in a different company, in a different sector, in a di different organization, right? In a different line of work. Because if you don't do that, if you skip that step and you go straight into the three month internship, and then on the first day of that internship, you say, Oh, geez, I, I don't think I can do this for three months, right? But now you've just signed up to do this for three months. But so, so you can find that out early on, right? You can do that informational interview first and then save yourself the three months. Now, because if you do that informational interview first and then you do your job shadowing, then you can ensure that that three month internship that you might want to do over the summer is with, is at a place that you know you want to be at, right? So based on the time commitment, that, that, that's what I would recommend to my current students. And that's what I would recommend to, uh, to my younger self as well. Is there anything else that you would like to, to share with our audience with, um, or with yourself? Because this is also, uh, like a, a very, very deep exercise because you are looking through your journey. So let me say one quick thing about this aspect of advice, right? So, you know, when you ask someone for advice, a lot of times you're, asking someone maybe more senior than you, maybe more experienced than you. And so it may be almost implicit that the advice, the suggestion that they give you is like, oh, this person said this, so I should, I, I better go do it, right? So, but, but it really is just advice. It's a suggestion. It's a recommendation. You don't have to listen to it, right? It's advice. There's no harm in getting free advice, right? So it never hurts to go, to go ask for advice. But, you know, think about the power of advice. So, these are lessons learned that took a lot of time for someone else to learn that they can teach you in a much shorter amount of time. So if it took me a year to learn a certain lesson, right? But let's say I can teach that lesson to you in one hour, right? It took me a year to learn. I teach that lesson to you in one hour. Now you've saved yourself a year of your life, right? That's very powerful. I mean, imagine how powerful this is, right? That, again, accelerates your career, accelerates your life. That's something, again, the Mentors Network can do. So advice, this aspect of advice is very powerful. My PhD work was on environmental su sustainability, right? So we have to toxins in the environment. We want to break them down, right? But then that got me thinking about not only the sustainability of the environment, but what about the sustainability of science itself, right? So who is there to do the science after you and I retire? If not our students, then who? Right? So if we're going to do good science and we're going to make sure that science continues after you and I retire, we need to make sure we focus on the people who are doing the science. Yeah, that, that's super, super interesting and great advice. Great advice about advices and very interesting, very ter ter interesting journey. I, I can totally see a lot of people relating, not just people that have grandmas that have cornfields, but Anyway, that anyone that goes through this experience of trying to figure out what, what comes next, what should I do? And this uh, whole um, conversation about the importance of mentorship, of reaching out to people, asking what are you doing? What, uh, how can I do what you are doing? Is really cool what you're doing. This, this is this is awesome. This is super valuable. And I'm sure a lot of people watching us right now will relate and this will resonate. And yeah. Hopefully it's useful to someone out there that probably we don't know, but you are impacting through this conversation as, as many people, like uh, many people that we meet during, uh, during our journey. Sometimes, of course, we have mentors that are people that really influence us, that know us, but sometimes you have mentors that don't really connect with you. That it's just one quick, quick moment, one important advice, and then this changes your pathway. And you, you don't need necessarily to meet this person, to know this person, but those small droplet, do, droplets of wisdom can be very, very powerful too. Thank you so much for this conversation. And I, I learned it a lot. I received a lot of advice from you and hopefully other people watching this this conversation receive it as well. All right. Thank you so much for having me on the talk show, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the conversation and I wish you a wonderful journey. Bye. That was an outstanding conversation. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Don't forget to check the previous episodes featuring Tessa, Dorothy and Bernie. 
this unfortunately is the season finale in our first season of IGEM Talk Show. I hope hearing about the very diverse pathways our amazing guests took inspiring you to build your own. See you around! <laughs>